Let's get more on this now. Joining me in the studio is Lee Jones, an international relations expert and lecturer at London's Queen Mary University. Thank you very much for coming in. So we're just getting the reaction there from the Philippines. Their government is being cautious about this. In China, they're very angry about this verdict. How much pressure is Beijing going to feel now to respond to this court ruling, given the nationalist sentiment that's been stoked around this issue? Well, you're absolutely right. The Chinese elite have stoked this, and there is a massive outburst of nationalist sentiment on Twitter and Weibo and so on. Many Chinese now believe their government's entirely false claims that the Chinese state has somehow occupied these islands for hundreds of years, which is just not true. So the problem is when you use nationalism to remain in power, as the Chinese Communist Party now does, you can be trapped into a situation of having to take action when you find these uh, eruptions. But on the other hand, I think cooler heads will probably prevail in the long term. We've already seen China stepping back from its assertive or aggressive posture that it's been taking over the past few years because it realises that it has actually damaged Chinese interests overseas. So what response can we then expect? Would there be an upsurge in activity in the region? My guess is that they might do a few military drills. They were doing that yesterday, some gestural politics. Uh, but I think in the long term, the Chinese will want to try to calm the region, reassure the region, and may want to try and cut a deal with President Duterte of the Philippines, as your correspondent was just pointing out. Oh, so there might actually be bilateral negotiations to try and... And would any deal then supersede this court ruling? Well, the, indeed. So this is what Duterte has been talking about during his election campaign. And what the Chinese have, that's been their long standing position that we can put sovereignty claims to one side and we can work on joint exploration and joint development. And that is basically Duterte's position too. And so it is possible that diplomacy can win out and some so kind of deal can be done. Despite the kind of ideological um, motivation, the nationalism you speak about, actually we can expect both sides, both the Philippines, they have a very interesting character now running mm. their country and President Duterte and of course what you were saying about the Chinese, actually they're much more pragmatic. This, this will be about economic on benefit on the Philippines on both side, sides. Yes, because you saw from those pictures there, there are not that many people interested in the mm. South China Sea and the Philippines. The same is not so true in China. It's much more difficult for the Chinese leadership to get themselves off the hook they've created for themselves. But in the long term, Will they know... Will economics dictate what they do, though, It's, it's not merely economics. Okay. It's also about the need for international stability and good relations with, with close-by countries. Talk to me about the possibility of China establishing an air defence identification zone in the South China Sea. This is something the United States has been worried about for a long time. Could that still happen in some shape or form? I think it would be seen as so provocative that it would do enormous damage to China's international standing in the region. When they declared one over the East China Sea, it caused massive outrage and in reality has not been enforced. Uh, and in the East China Sea, China has been moving to uh, reduce tensions with the Japanese and the same has been happening in the South China Sea. There's been a decrease in maritime confrontations in the South China Sea and so I think you can already see in Beijing people realising that things went badly wrong around 2012 and trying to rein in the various fragmented actors uh, that often act without a clear compelling oversight from Beijing uh, such as local fishermen, coast guards, the navy, national oil companies. These actors are often not very well coordinated in Beijing. They are not well coordinated and yet there is a precedent for, you know, we have seen violence in the past, I think between China and Vietnam in the 70s and 80s. You have some in the US that are pushing for a tougher response mm. there. Um, could we see uh, unintended escalation? There's always that risk, but it's a limited risk because most of the clashes happen between civilian vessels. So there have been about 400 clashes since 1990 in the South China Sea. The vast majority of them are about fishing boats being intercepted by coast guards on, on either side. And the, Navy, the navies rarely play any role. Uh, they're usually kept well in the background. So there is rarely any direct military to military contact. Mm -hmm. When that does happen, when the militaries are present, there's always the risk of escalation. But the fact that they've been kept in the background tells you that neither side wants an escalation in this case. Well, Dr. Lee Jones, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us on this.